But we're going to get started with Lloyd now. What's going on, Lloyd? How's my Wi-Fi? It's good. <laughs> I'm going to put a Teddy, Teddy Riley today, man. No, it's all good. <laughs> well, fingers crossed it, it all works out. How's everything going? Ain't it funny how bad Wi-Fi and got Teddy Riley back, back popping with the youngsters, huh? That's how it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, it's good, man. Um, everything's all right. I just spoke to uh, someone who was doing a story about uh, the 15-year anniversary for um, Thug Motivation 101, Jeezy's wow. debut album, which is coming up, uh, made me feel very fucking old. Um, however, uh, <laughs> something to be really thankful for is just how something can last through the times uh, like that, like music sometimes. So um, I'm just starting to have those kind of milestones in my life, man. And uh, yeah. I'm learning how to deal with it. <laughs> I mean, we're going to go through memory lane on this interview as well, so don't you worry. <laughs> so how are you doing, brother? Hey, I'm doing good. Always uh, appreciative that you take the time to talk to us. We've been doing interviews for many years now, so it's yeah. always always cool to reconnect. Where am I speaking to you from? Vancouver. Vancouver. Wow, that's like yeah. top five city of mine. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Expensive, but it's nice. Yes, absolutely. And, and you always show us love, so I appreciate that. But Lloyd, we got to get started here. We never got a chance to talk about your true album that came out last year or the year before. But man, like that album from top to bottom was such a great project. It really showcased your growth. And like, what was your biggest takeaway from putting that out? Because that was your first offering as an independent artist. Like, just talk about what you remember about all of that. Uh, first time doing something independently, um, the amount of pressure that you feel yeah. on back and your shoulders and your mind and your spirit mm -hmm. it increases exponentially. However, um, with that pressure also comes a perverse sense of freedom of mm -hmm. uh, being able to take it wherever you ever imagined it to be, um, mm -hmm. trying to incorporate more, um, bringing in the Spellman Women's Choir and who, which featured my cousin, my blood cousin, who I've watched wow. grow up, he was a baby. Um, wow. The only one that was really singing in the family. She watched that grow up to be have a, a more beautiful voice than me. And I was able right. to record her for the first time. Uh, incorporated my son crying in the studio. Um, just trying to be creative with um, with my life through the music. And then also just the fact that uh, I had been gone away from recording mm -hmm couple years um it gave me a challenge to try to make it as personal uh, and soulful as possible so just trying to attack all those different things um keeping in mind that um <laughs> if you break it you buy it uh you know in order to get it done, you have to um assimilate the cost first mm -hmm. and foremost also just trying to get more bang for your buck so quality over quantity if you will um True was probably the cheapest video I've ever shot, you know, just being mm. all the way. Um, yeah. But it ended up being the best video I ever shot. In my opinion, it's my favorite because right. it captured um, a, a vibe that I was looking for. So, yeah, that was an interesting project, man. And um, yeah. 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 I mean, Lloyd, do you remember the first time we did an interview? This was in Vancouver. This was at a hotel lobby. This was around 2012, I think, 2013 or 2012. And if if you don't remember it, right before I interviewed, you had this massive migraine and you were just stuck in your room for like four hours. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember this. And I was just talking to Ryan. And then when we did the interview, you know, it went great. But the impression that I got from you at that time, this was like after you had left inner scope and you were just kind of independent trying to figure things out and eventually you went on your hiatus and you know you spent a lot of time with family but um the impression that i got during that time was you were trying to figure things out as an independent artist you kind of didn't know which way you were going to go um mm -hmm. what, what what were those internal conversations like that you had with yourself and maybe with your with your friends and your family on where you were going to go next with your career i think just learning how to identify the opportunity in any situation. I mean, no matter how unfortunate, how um, uh, 
unplanned or uh, unpredicted, no matter how difficult, there's always an opportunity on the other side. You just have to see yourself to getting there. And uh, a big thing for me was, okay, I've been releasing music through major companies since I was yeah. like 12 years old. Um, a lot of that is all I had known. And yeah. a part of me was dependent yeah. upon other people being able to do things for me. However, by being in a major system for so long, being able to really see and understand how things were working, you know, how the radio game works, how the digital game works, um, how the recording game works, um, and then, of course, how the live touring game works. Right. Um, really trying to get to a place where it's like, okay, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to bet on myself. Right. I'm going to... And, and really, the hardest part of that was to be able to get over the fear of falling or the fear mm -hmm. of, failing, you know, of actually putting forth more of your spirit for it right. to be rejected or to not connect. And um, I think that could be something that exists in any artistic person. However, once you can get to a place where you don't mind falling, mm -hmm. then you really start to move and... Um, that's really just what it, it took for me to have to to get to that point. Um, yeah, so I, I I didn't know it was a blessing at the time, but right. there's been a few moments in my in my career in music where things seemed as one thing in the beginning, and then it turned out to be like the perfect situation for me. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. a wonderful thing. And then we fast forward now to 2020. You just dropped a new record, Slow Wine Baseline, and Lloyd. I gotta say. And I was just mentioning to this off, you know, before you got on, this is, if this isn't our favorite song of the year, it's, it has to be like top three, like just the vibe of this song and what you brought to it. You brought Teddy, Teddy Riley along for the ride. Like just talk about creating that song because it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Well, um, it started off with a sample from a, a friend of mine named Rod, who was actually just the engineer. He was just beginning out as an engineer when I recorded mm -hmm. the true record. And Rod would come to the studio every day, and every day he would carry this keyboard on his back. Mm. He would come straight from work. He would have the keyboard with him. He would come in. Sometimes he wouldn't even really get to play the keyboard, but I think just it was his way of being ready for anything. And also, I remember first time I met him, he asked a lot of questions. He just asked mm. question, question after question. And then fast forward, um, over the past two years, he's been sending me his own productions mm. and um, they've been pretty good actually. And they've just been getting better and better. And so when he sent me the concept for slow wine baseline, yeah. um, it was like in a beat pack with about seven or eight different things. And immediately I just locked onto that and I'm like, let's just build this, let's build this out. Right. And so from that, we wrote the song and um, even that was an interesting experience because when I originally wrote the song, um, the the hook that is there now was the verse originally. Oh, wow. And it took from my friend Jasper when I was singing it down for the first time. He said, Ooh, that's the hook right there. Mm. I'm like, no, that's not what the idea was. He says, no, but that just feel like Curtis Mayfield or something like mm -hmm. the way you singing it. So uh, we made that the hook and then we just created the rest of the song after that. And um, me getting Teddy on it was something that I just kind of manifested through putting it out there in the universe. I just kept saying, uh -huh. I want Teddy on this. I, I really, God, I want to hear Teddy do the voice box. I want to hear Teddy mm -hmm. do the voice box. Yeah. And um, really just through chance uh, in the past, I think two or three weeks, I was able to get Teddy to do the voice wow. box on there. Another dope thing is that when Teddy first sent it back to me, he had reproduced the whole record. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he redid the drums and everything. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to use those drums, but I'm going to use this, you know, I'm going to use this and this. And he said, look, uh, you just take what you want, you know, but I was mm. just feeling it. I thought you did a good job. So wow. here, you know, it's better to have more than too much than not enough. And, um, yeah, I went in and, uh, reproduced it, added the extended version on, and um, I love it, man. It's like yeah. one of my favorite accomplishments as a musician. 
I mean, just the extended version alone, like that is that is an amazing piece of work. Like, whose idea was it for the extended version? I, uh, well, I mean, not to sound crazy, but that was my idea totally, and it was because. Yeah. Um, growing up, I remember hearing music that lasted for six, seven, eight minutes long. You know, like a lot of my favorite artists, they have music on their albums. It's not just the radio version, which is two minutes and 30 seconds, three minutes and 30 yeah. seconds. They let the shit vibe out. And mm -hmm. I was like, this is a perfect opportunity, mainly because we don't have nowhere to, to go right now. We can actually sit down for eight minutes yeah. and listen to a song if we was in that kind of mood because we don't have a lot to do. So I'm like, let me do this um, extended version for all my people in quarantine. And and then I also do a radio version because uh, it'll be hard to play something that's six minutes long on um, satellite radio. So. Yeah. <laughs> And and we're waiting for the extended, extended version that's 20 minutes long, Lloyd. Because <laughs> it's, it's just amazing just to see that song ride out to the hey, very well, end. Look, well, actually, I'm waiting on uh, a remix from Teddy. Uh, wow. Teddy wanted to put his own mix on the track. So uh, mm -hmm. I thought maybe we would have like a mixed battle uh, in the next week or two where t we'll see whose version uh, goes harder, mine or Teddy's. But. Um, I also am going to release a version of the song where it's just the vocal a cappella mm. and Teddy's voice box underneath because wow. the edits that I made to Teddy's voice box really don't highlight the amount of work that he did underneath that track. There's all kind of stuff that's going on that's not in there anymore because I simplified it. But when you listen to just the a cappella and Teddy, it sounds like mm -hmm. a whole different experience. So wow. Do that also. I'm looking forward to that. And, and Lloyd, you mentioned Jasper. And Lloyd, we've we've been doing a lot of interviews with different producers over the last few weeks during this quarantine time. Eric Hudson was one we did, and he mentioned Jasper. <laughs> and a couple of other people have mentioned Jasper. So, and you guys have done so much work, even dating back to the first album. Like, what is that chemistry like with Jasper? Because you guys have created hits together. Well, Jasper is uh, from Southwest Atlanta. I grew up in East Atlanta, and um, the first uh, manager that I had also discovered Jasper. He used to be in the singing group. Mm. And at Jasper came in and wrote some of my very first songs that I ever recorded in my life mm. as a kid, 10 years wow. old. And from that, I think I just identified with Jasper, his style, um, his mentality, his spirit. And from there, we just kind of started kicking it a lot more. He would let, you know, I was the youngest. I was a kid, but he would let me come and hang out with him. And um, when I started recording with Dallas Austin at DART, um, yeah. he was looking for a songwriter to help out with a song at the time. And I, I'm like, hey, I got somebody that's real dope. And he's like, <laughs> call, him up, call him up down here. And I called Jasper, and Jasper came down. And uh, Jas and Dallas fell so in love with Jasper's talent, he ended up offering him um, a deal on the spot. And he, of course, would go on to songwrite for a lot of hits for a lot of people. Um, but uh, that's just been my ace since day one. Wow, that's amazing. And, and I got to ask, um, you know, just watching your growth as an artist, like I was just talking about this off the air, because I've been listening to you since, since Southside. I was like 14 at the time when Southside came out. And what I love about your music is as I've grown and matured as a person, you've done the same. And it's like, it's almost parallel in terms of like, I know where you were at a certain point in your career just by listening to the music. Sure. And I can relate to it. Like when Street Love came out, I was 16 at the time. So I was as fly and as cool as you were during Street Love. But then True comes out and I'm at that stage now. I can relate to some of those records. Like, where did you get that blueprint from to understand, like, you got to make music that's age appropriate, that that's for the time that you're currently, you know, going through? Oh, uh, well, it's two things, really. One is the fact that I record under my real name. So mm -hmm. I don't have an alias that I can run behind. I don't have a dual personality that I represent in my music and in, in my regular life. It's Lloyd. Mm -hmm they kind of always cross paths. So it's just a reflection of really where I am personally. But also, uh, I just realized that in life, you know, the same things that's cool to you uh, yeah. usually 
every five years or so. I mean, when you're 16, 17, 18, the same thing that's cool to you is not the same thing cool to you when you're 25. And right. the same thing when you're 30 and 35 and so forth. So I just thought um, to be able, one, really when I went to um, record with Murder, Inc., it gave me a freedom to actually start writing my own songs as a kid and let those songs actually reflect really where I was at. You know, right. I mean, just record the nice songs that's crafted for a young person to sing by a bunch of songwriters and producers that have been hired by a label head at some writing yeah. camp. It's really just me in there doing what I feel. And um, um, I think that's just really what it is, man. Um, anything other than that is uh, pretty much chance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no one else can write a record like ATL Tales other than you, because that was your experience. <laughs> I just listened. Hey, man, I love that intro. Yeah. Let me tell you what's crazy. The intro, man, that intro ended up being a big pain in the ass because the producer sampled unknowingly to us, to me, he said he had a very small sample of Fleetwood Mac in that song. Oh, wow. You wouldn't know it, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Because of that one sample, Fleetwood Mac was like, <laughs> we have <laughs> all the money for the uh, project. <laughs> oh, That's man. That's crazy. And I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lord, I want to take this time here. You know, we have a bit of time left. Um, let's go through your discography here. And what I want to know is, you know, when you reflect back on your mindset, during these albums you know we just talked about my experiences with your album but just talk about your mindset when you were putting out these albums and making them so let's start with the debut south side you're a young singer just trying to make it like what was your mindset at that time oh wow um my mindset was i am just a figurehead but mm. i am Sending all of these people that have helped me out along the way to get to this point, to this debut point. Um, some of those songs I recorded under Magic Johnson's label. Um, wow. So I was thinking about the staff there. I was thinking about the producers there. I was thinking about writing Hey Young Girl at Robin Thicke's house. I was thinking about recording wow. South Side. I was like 15 years old. Um, mm -hmm. So I was kind of thinking about it would be in a culmination of all of these wonderful experiences up until this point. Um, then uh, I think I was just not, I didn't know really. I was, my mind frame was I'm young. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going right. with it. Yeah. Wow. And then with Street Love and Lessons in Love, this was like your coming out party. You had to create your own team. You guys put music together. It worked. And like, it really catapulted you to a whole new different level. Like, just take me back to that era. Uh, man, Street Love was uh, shortly after federal indictment trial. Mm -hmm. um, so it was um, like walking on eggshells at times because uh, I needed to put music out. However, I was in a situation that was making it a bit difficult. Um, so it really was a, a a time of just thanks, you know, like, oh, my God, I'm so thankful that this ended up working out because just last week, the shit was looking a lot different. Um, Katrina happened during that time. So it was an interesting time for my family and for the city of New Orleans. And um, I remember, again, just being pretty ignorant to what success was because mm -hmm. I didn't even know you was going to be as popular. Um, right. I remember over some of the lyrics, so I was just trying to get out of my own way. And mm -hmm. uh, man, just thankful. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then we got to talk about the Kings of Love album. Um, this was the one that you did with Polo, Kings of, Kings of Heart, sorry. That album, I feel like that should have like exploded because like some of that stuff that you guys did on there, it was magical. Obviously the numbers weren't there, but like just reflect back on that era. Cause what you told me when we met was that um, that was one of the hardest albums that you had. That was one of the hardest albums to make. 
Yeah, yeah. Vocally, that was the hardest album I ever made. Um, thanks to you know, of course, Polo uh, and his strict regimen of uh, you know just making sure that you push yourself. And um, you know, we was training very crazy heavy during the yeah. making of that album every day. Um, so a lot of hard work. But then also, I remember again, it was a moment of humbleness because. You know, I'm like, no, no one wants to hear me yodeling on this song. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what the fuck are we doing? You know, right now? What? Wait, why did I do that? Why did that just come out? You know, mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, I guess just not having the foresight, but trusting the foresight of others to uh, walk with them. So, um, yeah, I think uh, that was an interesting time also because um I went with Interscope instead of Young Money. And yeah. even to this day, I mean, who knows? You know, mm -hmm. things right. might have been a lot different if I went the other way. But I might right. not have had Lay It Down. So no regrets. Mm -hmm. But you, that was a moment where it could have went either way. So, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so we talked about the True album. So we got to talk about Lloyd's current state of mind, where you currently are in your career. Um, Slow Wine Baseline is out now. New album, I think, is in the works. Um, I, know, I know Out My Window was one that you were working on prior to True. Like, where are you at with all of that? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I've played with the title for many, many years. Um, Out My Window was actually a concept I had before I made True. And it, it mm -hmm. consisted of a bunch of songs that I wrote strictly on the guitar. It was just guitar, vocal yeah. type of stuff. But... Um, uh, I think it was a, a little bit more on the folksy side. I still got a mm -hmm. little bit of street in me that I want to express. So trying to find a balance, <laughs> I ended up kind of leaving that project alone. However, um, yeah. I, I'm about 10 songs in, um, solid songs that I like. Uh, I'm going in today to record uh, some more choir vocals on the mm -hmm. track, uh, Something to Believe in uh, Positive Energy. And uh, I look look to have something out real soon. Uh, I'll definitely release some more um, individual songs before I put right. a full scope project out. But um, yeah, Slow Wine, just, I just wanted to have something that was like, just that slow dance song. I mean, mm -hmm. that just yeah. does not exist on the radio anymore. I don't know why, but it just doesn't. Um, and then also, I think the music has just become so aggressive. I mean, the youngsters, they so fucking aggressive. It's like, <laughs> hey, man, is anybody fucking out here? Is anybody making love out here? What the hell is going on? Why is everybody mm -hmm. just pushing and shoving all day? It's like, okay, that has that has its place. But yeah. you got to have a balance because you got to be able to cool it down, man, and yeah. decompress and... You know, I mean, you don't want to be on 10 all the time. So um, I just thought, hey, you know what? This is wide open. I'm going to go for it. Yeah, and that's why we have you here for that. And, and lastly, Lloyd, we're almost out of time here. But I got to <laughs> ask this with all the craziness that's happening in the world right now. And, you know, you're one of the fortunate few that have been able to travel across the world. Like you've been to Vancouver. And I would assume that your everyday life, or, or your experience in Vancouver is probably a lot different than the everyday struggle that you go through, mm -hmm. you know, in, in life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and being that I'm from Vancouver, I don't get to see the everyday struggle that you get to, that you're, that you're a part of. So right. my question is, like, I, I've done the donations, I've made the posts just to voice my opinion on racism and all that. But what in your heart do you feel like we need to do more of or what do we need to do to just make sure that we're continually doing the right thing and just pushing forward and making sure that this movement doesn't go unnoticed. Well, the first thing is we have to care. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually I think what is actually happening is slowly but surely, uh, I do believe that kind hearted, um, progressive thinking, um, less ignorant driven, society is becoming more of a majority every day. However, you do have these pockets of resistance that still exist um, mm -hmm. from older generations and also those that have inherited 
that mind state from the generation before them. They still exist. However, we continuously, slowly but surely change the scales. And um, I mean, we are not that far removed from 60 years ago, from 100 years ago, when this place was really fucked up. So um, with that in, in consideration, what I would really, really, really like to do is to every time that someone is upset about mm -hmm. any act of violence from someone who does not look like them against someone that does, yeah. maybe that makes them love the person that does look like them a little more, really support them, really yeah. love them and care mm -hmm. about their existence, not just in a time like this, but always. Right. And at the same time, uh, I would just like to see people in power be held accountable for the acts that they commit against the powerless, because that's really what this is about. It's about right. a person of power, as in a police officer, being able to, to take the life of someone mm -hmm. who is seemingly powerless. No matter what color they are, it's really an abuse. And yeah. the fact that they don't get held accountable for it is what's causing so much anger. Um, so... I would like to see some accountability in the world and uh, just a lot less ignorance. I think that's what we have to do. I mean, you know, we grow up kind of in a state of ignorance that we inherit from our parents mm -hmm. and from their parents. It's, it's not a diss on them. It's just they are a sign of their times. But we have yeah. the ability to see, have foresight beyond them, to be able to mm -hmm. have technology that allows us to connect even more than they did. So we take that and uh, we just keep ridding ourselves of ignorance. I think we'll be all right, man. That's a beautiful thing, Lloyd. You know, we're, all, we're out of time here, but I mean, <clears throat> I just gotta say, I'm so proud of, you know, just watching you and your career and your evolution. And even I remember the first time I watched you in Vancouver, that show had probably about a hundred people in there. And now you're doing this millennium tour where you were and it's like 20,000. <laughs> And just to see, just like you rebuilding your career and just where it is now, it's an amazing thing, man. It's probably 100 people in there and 20 of them was staff. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> but, man, just to see the evolution and, and just rebuilding that career, not a lot of people can say that they've done that and you have. So I, I just got to give you so much respect for that. Hey, man, I, I want to thank you, man, for giving people their flowers while they're still around. Um, I mean, this was actually felt like a good piece of conversation right here. And um, also, um, I know that you are Canadian. I don't know if you are a Canadian or if you just live there, but I Canadian, assume Canadian. I know yeah. you are Canadian. Um, it's so easy for you to be like, look, that's over there. I'm over here. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? The fact that you actually care, the fact yeah. that you actually donate, even if you can or can't but that you yeah. actually want to participate, that really says a lot about you as a man and as an individual um, and as a human being. So I thank you for that. Absolutely. And Lloyd, if you ever want to come to Canada and just live there, I have a room for you too. So. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, Lloyd. Well, we're out of time here, but once again, appreciate you for everything. And, you know, just keep us posted on everything you have coming up. And, uh, you know, we're going to support... Hey, man, you're so lucky you're in Van City right now, man. So lucky. <laughs> yeah, we just, did a, we just did a protest yesterday and no violence. It was just peace. So that was nice to see. The Vancouver way. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, Lloyd, well, you take care. And again, we'll talk soon. Thanks for having me. Take care. All right, that was Lloyd. And uh, that was a fun one. So I uh, hope you guys stay safe and we'll talk again soon.